This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwa arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Today's guest is a man whose voice has brought to life some of our favourite video game characters in games such as Twisted Metal 4, Sonic Adventure and Star Trek Online, but there's one character he's known for above all of them. It's the voice of Duke Nukem, John St. John. Welcome, sir. Hail to the king, baby. <laughs> Are you stocked up on bubblegum today? Yeah, I've got plenty of gum, uh, which, which is unfortunate. That means I, I have no Duke voiceovers to do. I'm spending all my time chewing gum these days. <laughs> so, John, um, let's go back to the start. What was life like for you before you started using your voice professionally? Just give us some background on the early years of a, a young John, if you will. Wow. Well, I, I would have been a teenager um, I, because I started using my voice professionally at 14 years old. Um, prior to that, I was just a troublemaker in school that got, you know, B's and C's and, uh, you know, not great grades. I didn't like school and I, and I, I refused to do homework. I always passed tests, but I hated homework because schoolwork should have been done at school, not at home. That was my opinion. You young children do not listen to me. <laughs> and did you realize that you had a talent for voice acting at, at a young age? You know, my uh, my brothers and my sister did because, uh, you know, we we grew up watching Saturday morning cartoons on, on American television. And, and I would uh, do my impressions of the characters all morning long <laughs> and then all day until my brothers, you know, would sit on my head and fart and make me stop doing it. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, I knew early on. And then um, when I was uh, a young teenager in junior high school, uh, I started doing voices, uh, you know, at school just to entertain my, my friends. And, uh, they all suggested that I, I go down to the local radio station and get a job. And by golly, I did. Oh, okay. Um, just talk us through that then. How did you land that first job at your local radio station? It was like, I got a wild hair up my ass and I decided one day to ask my dad to drive me down to the local, uh, AM radio station, uh, because I, I wanted to see if I could get a job. I, I, uh, had been a, a switchboard operator at a Howard Johnson's hotel prior to that, which was not a very good experience. Uh, and, and I knew I needed something else cause I wanted to work, you know, as a kid, I wanted to make money to buy stuff. And, uh, so one Saturday afternoon, my, my father agreed to drive me down to the radio station. I, I met the program director who was on the air at the time. And he said, yeah, just go on down to the basement of our production studio and make me an air check. <laughs> and, I, and I said, Duh, what's an air check? And, uh, he said, well, okay, there's a bunch of 45 records down there and a reel to reel recorder and a mixer. So you just uh, talk into the records and record it on the reel to reel. And I said, okay. And, you know, he did his four hour radio show while I sat down there in the basement studio and uh, played with the equipment until I figured out how to do it. Probably took me an hour just to figure out how to work the gear. <laughs> and then I started talking up uh, the ramps of Barry Manilow Records and you know ABBA Records. And after his air shift, he came down to the production studio, said, okay, let's listen to what you got. And he played the tape back and he said, okay, you're on next Saturday night. Oh, wow. And it started okay. just like that. I was hired immediately. As easy as that. <laughs> yeah, really. I mean, right place, right time, I guess. Mm. I, I understand the sentiment on the switchboard. One of my earliest jobs was uh, working on a switchboard. I think I lasted two weeks. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I would have preferred if the traffic was one way, that's for sure. <laughs> right. Now, when, when you were working the switchboard, I'm, I, I don't mean to to have you date yourself, but how many years back are mm, we talking? That would have been about 1994, around about oh, then. Okay, so that was uh, the modern age. This is the 70s when I'm doing the switchboard, and it's all uh, pull cords and patch plugs, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was no plugging and unplugging for me. That's exactly right. You just did the universal symbol for that. <laughs> So, of course, um, what my audience is going to be most interested in is the video game aspect of your career. Sure. Were you a gamer as a kid? Uh, I loved the original Nintendo games when they came out. And I had the Atari when I was a kid. Uh, mostly for me, it was uh, arcade video games back in the 1970s. I mean, when Pong came out and then, uh, gosh, so many, uh, so many other really cool old games like... Um, Oh, shoot. Now I can't remember the name of them because I was so old. Uh, Defender. Uh, Galaxia was one that I really enjoyed playing. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the uh, the game where you, you'd spin the dial and shoot in toward the uh, geometric figures to take out the... Uh, asteroids? The, the 
that one? No, it wasn't Asteroids, okay. but Asteroids is another one that I played. Yeah. Uh, but my gaming experience uh, was, you know, way back when uh, at the arcades. And then in the um, late 80s, early 90s, uh, I was one of the first to get a 16-bit game uh, system called Turbo Graphic 16. And uh, my friends, after uh, after a long day at the radio station, uh, we would play football all Friday night, all night long, you know, drinking beers and playing football. And uh, that was pretty much my video gaming experience until uh, Duke Nukem came along. And that uh, that uh, it reignited my my love for playing games. Mm. Tempest? Was it Tempest with the dial? Tempest, it was. There we go. Exactly. We got that. Cheating. Somebody <laughs> told <laughs> no not at all not at all so you just mentioned duke nukem there of course which uh you're you're most well known for in the video game circles how did yeah. you become involved then in that duke nukem project in the first place well i had moved here to san diego in 1990 from philadelphia um as part of my radio career and at that point i was no longer a dj i was a production director you know, I was making the commercials and the promos and, and making parody songs and doing musical productions, that kind of thing. And um, one Friday afternoon, we had a female voice talent come in to record an auto dealer ad by the name of Lonnie Manella. And I'm sure a lot of your, your viewers and listeners know the name Lonnie Manella. She uh, is a pro prolific voice actor herself and uh, was at the time one of the top casting directors in the video game industry. So she came in to record this auto commercial. And while I'm setting levels on her microphone, she goes into all these wacky, crazy voices. And uh, so I decided I put on a uh, turn on my microphone and started making wacky, crazy voices back at her. And she said, wow, you've really got range. Would you consider voicing video games? And I said, voicing video games? There's no voices in video games. I mean, this was 1994. She said, well, there's about to be, and there's this game that you might be suited for. We we, we like the timber of your voice for this guy. Uh, it's called Duke Nukem. And, of course, you know, the first time you ever hear Duke Nukem, you laugh. So I laughed. And she said, well, you know, you laugh all you want. This is serious. This is a real job. Are you interested? I said, sure. So the following day, the, the Saturday, I came back to the radio station on the weekend to, uh, to connect with George Broussard in um, – Texas, uh, who is one of the creators of Duke Nukem, and, and he was the one who was uh, decidedly going to cast the character. So Lonnie and I are in the studio. George is on the phone. George describes the voice he hears in his head as Charles Bronson. And I went, <laughs> well, Charles Bronson kind of sounds like this. And uh, Lonnie said, no, no, Charles Bronson, that's not the tonality. Think more of Dirty Harry, the Clint Eastwood Dirty Harry. And I went, go ahead, punk, make my day. And George said, you know, that's that's a good sound, but Duke is roided out. He's a big monster of a guy. And I said, oh, I'll just lower my voice. and went, go ahead, make my day. And he said, that's the voice. And it stuck immediately. And it's interesting, the, 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 uh, the similarities between getting cast as Duke Nukem and, and being cast as Big the Cat kind of happened the same way. I did one stupid voice for Big the Cat when they said, it's a stupid character, you know, a big dumb cat. I, I did a, a Big the Cat voice like this. And immediately the Japanese director uh, on the line from Tokyo said, yes, that voice. And I went, no, no, I was just kidding. I said, no, that's what we want. So, you know, first try sometimes works. <laughs> that was Big the Cat in uh, Sonic Adventures, wasn't it? Right, one. right. Yeah. So so Duke's voice developed really that quickly. There weren't any other rejected versions of Duke's voice or anything like that. It really was that smoothly done. It was. It took literally five to ten minutes before they said, yeah, you got it. That's the voice. Hmm. And the recording process, you said, was remote. Um, did you ever get to go to 3D Realm Studio to work? No, no. In fact, I... Uh... I don't know that they even had studios back then. Everything was done from uh, remotely from wherever you could. So I, I recorded everything. Uh, all the Duke voices for the original games were recorded at the radio station on a uh, an AKG C414 microphone. I thought you might be interested in that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but at this point, even when you were recording the lines, your expectations must have remained pretty low for what this might turn into um, because oh. you'd already said, you know, voices, they don't exist in video games. So... It must have just been another gig to you at this point. It was. I had no idea that there would be any kind of following or anything. But, you know, when I got a copy of the game and I sent a copy of the game to uh, my oldest brother back in Virginia, he and I would play Duke matches online through the modem. Remember, it took five <laughs> minutes to connect and you'd play for like 15 minutes and it would disconnect when somebody called or tried to send a fax. Remember <laughs> faxes? And, uh, yeah, I had no idea anybody else was ever playing the game. 
in the beginning. I thought, okay, yeah, this is a cute thing, whatever. Yeah. So it was never weird to you to sit and play the game and hear your own voice. Oh, it was <laughs> <laughs> It was fun. I'm like, oh, I forgot I said that. You know, and hearing my voice played back in eight bit, you know, uh, low quality was was a hoot too because it's like, wow, that doesn't even sound like me. It's so distorted. Yeah, yeah. And do you do you have any favorite catchphrases then from that original Duke Nukem 3D game? What are the uh, what are the ratings on this program? <laughs> oh, I'll bleep out anything that needs to be. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, well this one this one can be used. This is from Duke Nukem Forever. And it's my favorite line because it's naughty, but not nasty. It's a, uh, I had eggs for breakfast. Your mom had sausage. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> so, and, and by the way, I should let you know that was written by a woman and all of the lines in Duke Nukem forever were written by two women. <laughs> Because I, I think they're just naughtier than guys are, really. Yeah, more creative in the use of their language. Instead of just using an expletive, they could a bit more imaginative, such, perhaps. Yeah, such a polite way to put it. You're yeah. so polite. <laughs> Everybody in the UK, you're all so nice and polite. Speaking of which, are you ever asked to voice lines that you've declined to do on your on the basis of your own moral principles, or um, you know? I have. You have. I okay. actually have a very interesting story about that. Um, something that led to the best gig I ever had. So back in um, late 2015, early 2016, um, I got a uh, an invite from an ad agency in Los Angeles that I'd done work for before. They said, "Hey, the leading candidate for president in the Republican Party wants you to be the voice of his national ad campaign." And and my first uh, feeling was, "Wow, a national ad campaign that pays big." And I went, "Uh oh, are we talking Donald Trump?" And they said, "Yes." And I went, "No, thank you." And the guy goes, serious? It's it's a national campaign? I said, yeah, well, I, I couldn't live with myself if I helped him get elected. So I turned it down. And then a few days later, I posted on Facebook. I said, it's not like me to turn down you know, a good job when it comes along or one that pays really well. But I could not, in clear conscience, become the voice of Donald Trump for president. <laughs> and, well, Reddit picked it up. And then it got on the Huffington Post. It went viral. And... Um, you know, a lot of, lot of, lot of clicks, a lot of likes, a lot of shares, and the next thing I know, about three weeks later, I get a call from the creative director of an ad agency in New York City, who said, "Hey, we're doing a big year-long campaign for the Bud Light party, and you're the guy who's Duke Nukem, right?" And I said, "Yeah." He goes, "I'm a fan." <laughs> I couldn't believe the guy was a fan. He said, "I saw what you said on Reddit about not doing Trump's uh, voiceovers. I think you're just the man for the job." So uh, there was this year-long ad campaign in 2016 that featured uh, Seth Rogen and Amy Schumer called the Bud Light Party, and I was the voice of it. So raise one to right now, the Bud Light Party, and uh, <laughs> the rest is history. It was the best-paying job that I ever got, paid my bills for three years on that one gig. And it's all because I would not do Donald Trump's voiceovers. That's a nice story. Yeah. Sticking to your moral principles paid off in that instance. That's good to hear. Yeah, good to hear. Lucky with that. Hmm? So Duke Nukem 3D was released in 1996, I believe. Um, but there is a lesser known game from the same year, which had the most outrageous voice clips in the menu. And I didn't know that you'd voice this until I was researching it today. But it was a game called Big Red Racing. Do you remember voicing oh, that yeah. game? I forgot about Big Red Racing. That was a long time ago. Yeah, there were some outrageous clips about fingers and belly buttons in the menu. And <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Can you remember any of those clips? <laughs> I, I wish I could remember them. Do you, you don't happen to have any archive that you could play. Oh, do you? I tell you what, we'll cut some in now so that the viewers oh. can hear. Yeah. And now, just what you've been waiting for, the expletives portion of this tape. Woohoo! Why, that ain't my belly button. <laughs> well, that ain't my finger, neither. <laughs> Jeez, come on! What are you waiting for? Christmas? Hey, Baba Louie! I'll do the driving round here! Yeah, that's all, folks. There we hey, go. Hey, those are great. Thanks for sharing them. <laughs> <laughs> seamless, seamless. Right. <laughs> so, um, how influential then was the success of Duke Nukem on your career after 96? Did it open doors? primarily for the video game work or or did its influence transgress the entertainment formats for you it did transgress all entertainment platforms in fact uh well let's see where do we start um i i, I guess with convention appearances uh for the first six seven years after duke nukem 3d came out i didn't know anybody played it it had a following and then all of a sudden i start getting calls from uh, the con chairs of different conventions around america 
saying, hey, would you come be a guest? And I said, why? <laughs> they said, because you're Duke Nukem. I went, oh, people like that game? And, and they quickly informed me, yeah, it's huge. People love it. It's a, it's, it was like the first big first person shooter with a voice to it, you know, a real, a real uh, personality. And uh, your fans want to meet you. I'm, okay, I'm good with that. So I've done so many conventions over the years and all around the world. I, I was in uh, Plymouth uh, in England uh, back in 2014. I went to Australia. I've got invites to Dubai and Germany. And, you know, so I get to travel all over the, the world doing uh, convention appearances and being paid for it, which is so cool because I – would have done them for free. Don't tell it. <laughs> but just to meet the fans and hang out with them, I, I, you know, which I do. I, I love going to conventions mainly to meet the fans because they're so cool. And, and and any huge group of people that give you unconditional love, how can you how can you not just thrive on that? You know, it's been great. And and the other doors that opened for me, of course, were more video games. As it turns out, you know, as the years went by, um. It, Gamer nerds who grew up playing Duke Nukem 3D, who became game developers themselves, said, oh, we got to have John St. John on our game. So there are a number of, probably a dozen video games that I voiced that were based on, it didn't matter if I was the right voice for it or not. I mean, I can always create a voice for a character, but that didn't matter. They just wanted me in their studio to meet me. So like Valve Software, when I worked for them, instead of me using a remote studio, they would fly me to Seattle and put me up in a five-star hotel and limo me around. I mean, wine me, dine me, 69 me, basically. But because they were fans and, and they wanted to see me face-to-face -face in the studio and hang out and drink tequila with me, I'm pretty sure that was a big part of it. And um, so that happened, too. As far as uh, the mainstay of my work, you know, it's mostly commercial work that I do, voiceovers. Uh, the Duke Nukem voice never really had any impact on that. But um, I, I do sell custom voice uh, overs of Duke uh, via Cameo. I'm I'm sure you're familiar with that app. And um, so that's the, the that's the three ways that uh, the Duke Nukem voice has really really boosted my career. Right. Well, well, if there are some links to that Cameo service that you offer, I'll certainly put it in the description of the video. Oh, cool. It's um, nice. I'm sure lots of people would love their own custom Duke Nukem. Uh, voiceover for sure i love it it's fun <laughs> so what some what are some of the other roles that you're particularly proud of from your voice acting career let's stick to um to video games for now can you just yeah. give us a few examples sure i i particularly can relate to the character jack boyd that i played in uh, this is the police he's the lead character in that game and and he's uh he's got a voice kind of like i Sounds like that, kind of like, what was my inspiration? Kind of Humphrey Bogart, just a little bit. But I sound like a weathered old 60-year-old private detective who's ready to retire. You know, that kind of voice. Um, I really like the voice of Axe, which is nothing but yelling more than anything in, uh, in uh, Dota 2. Um, because everybody loves Axe. Axe is Axe! All he ever does is yell. <laughs> And then uh, Admiral Kunka and uh, the original King Varian Wren in World of Warcraft. Uh, those were the same voice. I've used my bad Patrick Stewart, uh, Patrick Stewart impression many times in video games. It's always the same voice. It's like, hello, this is Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the Federation Starship Enterprise. So Admiral Kunka here. The rough seas were having sailors. Yeah, you know, it's the same voice. Uh, and the, the original King Varian Wren was that same voice, too. So how are you with accents then? Because obviously you're going into an English accent then with, with Picard. Are you are you able to adapt to pretty much all accents or do some um, give you trouble? I wouldn't say all. No, some are very difficult for me. Scottish, I love the Scottish accent, but I can't do it. I can nail Irish, that's not a problem. Several different uh, English dialects, Australian, German, Italian, French. Uh, I've been forced to do Russian accents, which I'm not comfortable with. But Lonnie Manella told me, you're fine, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, mostly for me, it's it's American uh, regional dialects that, that I get uh, hired a lot for. Uh, Sam Elliott sound-alike stuff, uh, Don Pardo sound-alike stuff. Those kind of uh, voice gigs I get regularly. Yeah, so if I were to ask you what a English Duke might sound like in English Duke Newcomb, <laughs> would what you would have to Dukes? create such a thing? Uh, Liverpoolian Duke. Uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> 
Scouse Duke, yeah. I've got no lily pocket. <laughs> no? <laughs> it's Love a it. sea of holes, mate. I don't know how Duke would sound English. That's, that's <laughs> we'll take it. Trick. We'll take the Liverpudlian Duke. Brilliant. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so has the Duke influence been all positive? Has it ever been a hindrance for you? Has it ever held you back at all? Or has it all been po- a positive experience? Oddly enough, uh, no negative stuff from Duke at all. I mean, um, for such a misogynistic killer, <laughs> it's amazing that I haven't taken more heat for that. Uh, when I make political commentary online, I do get a lot of uh, a lot of bad comments from uh how do I put this? I, I lean left, just so you know. I'm very liberal. I'm a Democrat here in the, the States. And when I uh, I don't like guns, and so I take a lot of heat from gun owners who love their guns that, you know, what a hypocrite this, this guy Duke Nukem is going on, you know, putting down guns and gun ownership. You know, how hip- hypocritical can you be? But that's, you know, th- that's a video game for God's sake. And Duke never shoots humans. He shoots aliens, you know. Um, I, I don't care for guns. It's not my thing. And, and, and a lot of people lose sight of the fact that I am not Duke Nukem. I am a voice actor who provides the voice of Duke Nukem. So his political leanings are not mine. Absolutely. Okay. I've got a, a few questions here from viewers. So I'm okay. going to, it's, it's a real mix. So I'm just going to put them to you as they come. Be the so, dumbest ones. No, no, no. <laughs> there are no stupid <laughs> questions. <laughs> I'm sorry. Just randomize them. How about that? Okay. So Gar- hey, can you tell me their names? Do you have their names? We've got their, well, we've got their handles. So Garo Ninja asks, do you have a favorite character that you voiced? Oh, got to be Duke Nukem, gotta without a Duke, doubt. Of course. I also like Dusty from uh, Rad Rogers. Uh, are you familiar with the Rad Rogers game? I'm not, no, no. What was the character there? Was it Dusty, did you say? Dusty, yeah. He's an old video game co- console. And and I love the character because uh, the Rad Rogers game, it's a side-scroller. It's really colorful and beautiful and cute as can be. And then all of a sudden, the language turns raunchy. <laughs> and you go, what the hell? So I, I'm very uh, fond of that character, too. Can we have a blast of Dusty's voice? What does he sound like? Hey, now that's how you do a cutscene right there. Is she smoking a wooden pipe? Is that a wooden pipe? You have to play the game to get what that's all about. But yeah. So he sounds kind of, he's an obnoxious loud guy with a foul mouth who tells the kid how he's going to play the game. <laughs> that is not how I expected my games console to talk to me. <laughs> Well, he's he's dusty and old, and and he's pissed off that he's you know a has been. Oh, kind of like me. Now we know where the motivation comes from. <laughs> so, next question: Paul Jacobson asks, uh, "How many people ask you to record a voicemail message as Duke?" Oh, all the time. Um, but I reserve doing them for free for fans who come to convention appearances. Um, I, I sell these things on Cameo. You know, usually it's uh, somebody wants me to propose marriage for them or say happy birthday or happy anniversary. And it's like, you know, 30 bucks, 35 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever it is on Cameo. Um, but when people email me or try to contact me and say, hey, can you? No, I'm not going to just, you know, I get paid to, you know, do voiceover work. So I, I don't mean to sound like, you know, a jerk, but uh, I reserve the freebies for people who come to meet me at conventions because I, I, I think they deserve it. Absolutely. Absolutely fair. Um, Luke MC says, you've got to ask him, what time is it? Would be, it's time to kick ass and chew bubble gum, <laughs> and I'm all out of gum. I'm pretty sure that's what Paul had in mind. I'm pretty sure it is, yeah. Um, hey, Paul, your face, your ass, what's the difference? <laughs> um, Chris uh, Lord asks, what did you think of Duke Forever? Do you have an opinion on that particular game? Good um, let's see, Duke Nukem Forever. Personally, I loved it. I thought at the time it came out, it was like the most interactive freaking game ever because you can you can mess with everything in that game. I love the dialogue. I like the game itself. I played it all the way through. And unlike, you know, you gamers out there who can play through a game in 15, 16 hours, it took me a couple of months to get through it. Uh, I have no talent as far as, you know, playing games anymore. But I thought Duke Nukem Forever was great. I think uh, it got panned by critics because it sat on the shelf for 12, 14 years, whatever it was. It should have come out in 2001. And I think that when it came out, gamers were expecting some uh, modern Call of Duty style graphics and such and, and, and better game engine. And that didn't happen because 
Well, you know, the game sat on the shelf forever until Gearbox picked it up and said, shit, we got to put this game out. Let's just do it. So they threw it together and released it. And uh, again, I thought it was great, regardless of what, you know, little pussy gamers think. Oh, <laughs> I'm so sorry, gamers. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I know it was rebooted m- many times throughout that kind of development hell cycle uh, and started mm-hmm. again. But I enjoyed what came out of it. It was OK. Um, did you find yourself having to go in and re-record things during that period or did the voices go down at the very end of that? Oh, yeah. It's like usual, you know, as a voice actor uh, in video games, um, I'm like a mushroom. They keep me in the dark and feed me shit. I didn't know anything until three months, literally, before the game was released. They called me one day and said, hey, John, guess what? It's a cold day in hell. And I said, what do you mean? They said, we're making the Duke Nukem Forever game. And I was thrilled. I said, oh, great. It's going to be 8-bit voiceovers again. They said, no, 16-bit. And I got all excited and tweaked up my studio, rewired everything just for that session. And uh, it was great because this was the first time in my career they said, uh, well, you've been Duke Nukem since 1995. We don't need to direct you. Just record the stuff and send it to us. So I got to just do it on my own, which was great because, you know, I direct other voice actors all the time. I I have a studio and people come in to record here all the time. And uh, I know I can direct myself as Duke and they let me. And uh, it went over quite well with everybody at Triptych Software and then at Gearbox. Mm. So given that freedom, did you get to do a bit of ad-libbing and and send in a few of your own phrases or did you stay on script for that? Um, Very little. There's only one line that I've uh, I've been asked about. Uh, While I was recording the game, my my, uh, son used to live with me here at that time in uh, in. 2010, 2011, when I was recording the Duke Nukem Forever game, his bedroom is right next to my studio. So he heard me recording and he heard me say something about, I'm going to get that douchebag. And after the session, he came in, knocked on the door and he goes, hey, you know what? Uh, Nobody says douchebag anymore. I said, what? He goes, it's douche nozzle. That's the dirtiest part of the whole douche system. And I laughed and I said, well, hell, I'm going to record that. So I re-recorded the line going, I'm going to get that douche nozzle. And uh, they laughed about it at uh, Triptych and at uh, 3D Realms and put it in the game. Oh, I mean, at uh, Gearbox. Oops, I said 3D Realms. Uh, <laughs> I still work with them, too. And, uh, yeah, so that that's about the extent of it. I don't, uh, I don't go off script too much because they spent a lot of time writing it. And as a voice actor, yeah, I can put my own spin on, you know, the way I inflect on the lines and, you know, where, where, where the emotion is coming from. But I rarely change any dialogue because writers spend a lot of time getting it just right. Who am I to go changing their words? I just don't feel right about it. Sure, sure. Um, Grant Frissom and Jamie Turner ask about LGR. I don't know if you're familiar with Lazy Game Reviews, a chap called Clint. Um, yeah, he does an impression of the Duke. Have you ever heard his impression? I'm not sure I've heard his. I've heard many impressions of the Duke, but uh, okay. I'm not sure it is. He does do a particularly good one, so we'll have to send you a link. They were asking if you could score out of ten his impression of the Duke, so uh, we'll, we'll yeah, have to come back to you with on that one on Twitter, perhaps. We'll do. <laughs> um, Chris Graney asks, "How much is your voice insured for?" <laughs> no insurance on my voice whatsoever. I I can tell you that I have a um. A very how do I put this uh, uh, rugged, uh, road tested, and uh, strong voice because well, just last night I was out singing with my jam band, and um, I, I do a lot of vocally stressful work from video games where there's a lot of emotives uh, that are you know killing, dying, stabbing, punching, falling, that kind of stuff, uh, falling off a cliff while on fire after being electrocuted and shot, then hitting the ground. I've had to do that before. Um, but my voice stays very strong. I've been very lucky that, uh, I, I, I stress it out all the time from highs to lows. And yet, you know, here it is still serves me well. Yeah. I mean, it's been, uh, several decades since you first voiced Duke, um, sorry to mm. remind you, but uh, <laughs> with age, do, does that bring any particular challenges to you as a voice actor to remain sounding like the Duke? Do you have to make changes? A little bit, because uh, when I think back to the original Duke Nukem game, and I know that's what uh, the 3D game, that's what the gamers love. They like that sound. But unfortunately, it's married to that 8-bit crappy quality. And Uh, I was being directed back then to keep my teeth clenched at all times and speak more monotone. So 
Looks like those alien bastards shut up my ride, was how I read it originally. Duke Nukem Forever, when I was free to direct myself and speak the way I wanted to, it would be, looks like those alien bastards shut up my ride. You know, a little more emotive, a little more inflection. Um, So the early Duke stuff, yeah, I can still read it that way, but I prefer not to. I, I like Duke to have a little more character than just that straight ahead monotone sounding voice. If you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris also follows up with a question about voice maintenance. He asks if you have any kind of voice maintenance routine uh, to keep it in top condition. Oh, absolutely. If I know that I have to do, for instance, a promo where, you know, in a world, in a land before time, before uh, the night before I I have to do that, I go out and I sing karaoke or I sing with a band because uh, stressing your vocal cords out for hours on end singing high notes when you get up the next morning you sound like this and uh, it, that helps a lot also i like to keep green apples around as much as possible because and you'll notice in most recording studios in the kitchen area there's always coffee and tea and water and snacks and green apples because one bite of a green apple will put the moisture of your mouth in just the right place to where you're not too many mouth noises you know it takes that away and it, and it and it helps you actually enunciate cleaner with less mouth noise if you just take a bite of a green apple oh just some of that acidic juice just cutting I through guess, everything yeah i guess that is what it is but it just uh, it makes the moisture content just right so you don't get too many smacks and pops right a bowl of green apples will will now be taking up residence in the cave here that's for sure <laughs> Do you have a problem with mouth noises no, I don't really have too much of a problem, but any anything that you can do to make small improvements is uh, right. is welcome. So we'll give it a go. Um, and then finally, what projects are you working on at the moment? Is there anything that you want to share with us? Uh, well, as far as video games go, I'm under two NDAs right now, so I can't tell you anything about those. Uh, the biggest projects I'm working on are commercial projects, and I'm producing an album right now for a uh, jazz band called Velvet Sushi. And, uh, yeah, funny name. But they're very talented local band from Solana Beach here in the San Diego area. And uh, that's what I'm working on right now. Nothing that the fans really are going to get their hands on anytime soon. Uh, they keep asking me about Duke Nukem. And I keep saying, well, it looks like Duke is left for dead. There's nothing happening. He was inserted into a few games in the last couple of years, like Bulletstorm Full Clip Edition. And and you can even play Duke Nukem in the Rad Rogers game. He's been put into several games, but nothing that uh, is really Duke's own platform. And and I I feel sad about that because uh, I, I thought Duke was a great character. Sure, he might be outdated, but, you know, all he needs is a sidekick. And as it turns out, there's a, an artist out of Italy. Uh, she goes by uh, Ardat Lily 2 on Facebook. An incredible artist. Her real name is Laura. She does really fine Duke Nukem stuff. And she's she's got a web series about Duke Nukem. Uh, last year, she reached out to me and she said, if Duke had a son, what would his name be? And about two seconds later, I said, Deuce. <laughs> you know, is it the second, junior, whatever, Deuce Nukem? She loved it. She created the character Deuce, who is Duke's son, and they have adventures together. And um, I'm kind of excited about possibly Duke having a sidekick, like Deuce maybe, who who brings him up to date. Uh, You know, you can't be that misogynistic asshole anymore, Duke. My God, dude, this is 2020. You can't say that. That is comic relief right there. That's funny. Give Duke a sidekick who who helps him be politically correct in this Me Too age. Right. And and it it writes itself. It's funny right there. Yeah. Parallels, perhaps, with uh, what James Bond has had to go through to bring it up to date. Maybe throw in a few strong female role models as well. And um, yeah, you've got a good show. Has has there ever been any talk of a Duke movie that you know of that you've been? Oh, yeah, there was. Absolutely. They were uh, there was actually uh, it was in the works with, I I believe, Paramount. uh, Michael Bay set as director and then they were talking about John Cena playing the part of Duke. But as it turns out, and I'm quite pleased with this, uh, Gearbox pulled the plug on that because I I guess it was going to Hollywood and uh, the story was being too corrupted. The character was being corrupted into something silly and that's not who Duke is. Thank you, Randy Pitchford, for pulling the plug because what I ultimately would love is an R-rated CG Duke Nukem movie. Not only because I get to do the voice, 
right? But because then it straight stays true to the character. You don't have to change his look. Duke will look exactly like he's supposed to. And in CG land, absolutely anything can happen. So why wouldn't you make a CG R-rated Duke Nukem movie? Well, if if that doesn't happen soon, then I, I think a Kickstarter should be on the cards to make it happen. <laughs> well, that would, I can't be the guy to suggest that. That's too self-serving. Maybe but, someone man, out I, there. Yeah. yeah, I would love if that happened. That'd be great. <laughs> And finally, where can we find out more about you or, or even book you if we wanted to? Have you got a website, John? Sure, sure. John St. John dot audio. Uh, just keeping in mind, my first name has no H in it. So it's J-O-N-S-T-J-O-H-N at. Uh, no, not at. <laughs> not an email address, dumbass. <laughs> John St. John dot audio. And uh, there you can book me for voice work or convention appearances. And uh, if I may g- give myself a plug here. Of course. Okay. So I've been doing conventions for so long and enjoying them that uh, what what started as a radio career and then a voice acting career has now uh, become a host and producer of my own fan convention, which is on a cruise ship, a Royal Caribbean cruise ship. Uh, last February was our first, uh, our, our inaugural cruise, I should say. Uh, we went uh, from Miami to the Bahamas for three nights. It was great. Everybody had a fantastic time. Uh, it, three weeks from now is our second annual John St. John's Not Con at Sea. And uh, we are on a cruise ship from Galveston, Mex- uh, Galveston, Texas to Cozumel, Mexico. Uh, this time it's a five-day, four-night cruise. Uh, we sold more tickets this year than the previous year. Uh, we've got really great guests coming along this year. Uh, in, in the first year, I made it all video game voice actors. This time, it's mostly anime voice actors. So we have uh, uh, J. Michael Tatum and Brandon McGinnis coming along, Austin Tyndall, uh, Samantha Inouye Hart. They're well known in the anime industry. And uh, they all live in Texas, too, which makes it easy for them to get to the cruise ship. <laughs> but that's uh, that's coming up soon. And that is uh, that's that's my mainstay now. That's the thing that makes me the happiest is working on my cruise con every year. I'm very excited about it. Wonderful. Well, make sure I've got the links for that. We'll put that in the description. Get on a cruise ship with Duke Nukem. And, um, well, he's captive then. He can't escape you. So, <laughs> exactly. exactly. Very good point. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in exchange for your plug there, um, can I ask you, sir, please, it's my friend Gary Pinkett's birthday tomorrow. So a little birthday shout out would be great if possible. Holy hell, Gary Pinkett's having another birthday? Hey, it's me, Duke Nukem, here to say happy frickin' birthday. Make it a good one, or else. Amazing. (laughs) Thank you very much, John. Thank you for all of the work that you've done over the years to bring us so much joy in the video games that we know and love. Uh, And all the best for the future, sir. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. If you enjoy my content and would like to support The Cave while receiving a completely ad-free experience and access to releases one week before they go public, then visit patreon.com forward slash retromancave and join the official cave dwellers. Thank you for your support.